Good morning, everybody. Let's hope this rain disappears and we get a day like yesterday. So um, welcome back. Um, and I'm thrilled to be uh, moderating this panel uh, with three very distinguished new friends. Madeline is an old friend from two days ago. Um, <laughs> So let me just introduce quickly, and then I'll sort of tee it up, and then we'll get into what I hope will be a very important, at times, um, sad conversation, but also uh, some interesting ways to think about one of the most significant challenges we face, which is fundamentally how we treat others in our lives, you know, others in the, in the broader sense of others. Um, I want to make a couple of quick corrections. I am not a neuroscientist. <laughs> um, I was a history major, <laughs> but I, knew, I know a lot of scientists, and if you've been to the States, I have stayed in a Holiday Inn Express. Uh, but as you may have heard yesterday, I'm the founder of the Beyond Conflict um, nonprofit that works in conflict and reconciliation around the world, and then a few years ago, we started working about a decade ago with brain and behavioral scientists because we discovered there's a lot uh, coming out of science about what it is to be human that we need to translate to the real world. So we'll touch about that in a second. So to my immediate left, and I think left is probably a good description as well, is <laughs> Madeline Habib. Um, and she's an extraordinary human being. And I asked, how would you best like to be described? And she said, humanitarian, seafarer, and activist. Which... Thank I, you for getting it right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then men who is the founder and executive director of Survivor Alliance. She's currently a PhD student on modern slavery. Is it at Nottingham? Or? Mm -hmm. And on the advisory council, uh, member uh, of the <clears throat> Obama White House on human trafficking, on the trafficking council, and I think stayed over for a period of time into the new administration. And then Kevin Beals, who is uh, a legendary scholar and activist uh, and helping really the world understand the nature of slavery, both in a historic scholarship context and as a, an unfortunate contemporary lived experience for many people. Um, he's been working uh, in this area for over two decades. Uh, and one of his books was um, listed by, I don't think it was, it was Time Magazine or? No, it was the British university sector. Ah, even more important, as one of the 100 world-changing studies in academia. So you can drop the mic after that, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> um, so the title of this is Disposable People. And one of the things we just talked about. Which was the name of the book. Which is the name of your book. Yeah, that book. Yeah, yeah that book, um, which is available outside, by the way. Oh. Yeah, yeah but not on discount. Um, <laughs> So uh, let me just say a few words, um, and I think we'll tee up a conversation um, and start with Kevin. And that is, when we think of disposable people, um, so many thoughts come to mind. Um, because we dispose of and treat so many people in our personal lives, in our national lives, in our international lives, uh, as one way of thinking it, in really horrible ways. So one of the things that my nonprofit started doing a few years ago with scientists at MIT and other universities is ask the question from a science point of view, what is the nature of dehumanization? Now, if I went around this room and asked everybody, describe dehumanization, you would either say, here's what I experienced, here's what I've observed. But unless you were a scientist, you wouldn't say, which surprised me when I first heard it, and then unfortunately made sense, that dehumanization in many ways is how we navigate our social world uh, through acts of omission the way we see people. Our, our brain's capacity to fully humanize and you might say empathize with others is limited. But that's not an excuse for behavior. Um, then we ask the question, so then what is the nature of how we treat people so horribly? And they said, well, there's omission and then there's commission. So we think of the Rohingya. We think of what's happened in Syria. We think about human trafficking. The very notion that we can treat people in some of the worst dehumanizing ways is not only evident in the world around us, but also finding that there's a scientific basis for understanding that behavior. And it's not to say there's an excuse for it, but if we want to address it, let's understand how we think as a species. And I should prime this by saying that one of the things that I learned as a non-scientist was a scientist saying to me 10 years ago that the most important thing to focus on is not 
what we think, but how we think. That how we think is so deeply unconscious with limited conscious access. That we think automatically in milliseconds. We think in groups, and we think with mental models of the world. Meaning that our brain is constantly predicting the world around us, even at this moment. And that it's a constru constructing almost an emotional response to the world. And I was mentioning earlier that what got me interested in science, brain science, was hearing a retired neuroscientist say to me when I had Jerry Adams come uh, attend a class I was teaching in Boston a few years ago. And he said, you can't make peace with a humiliated partner. And the scientist came up to me afterwards and said, you know, there's a lot of brain science behind that. And when I said, what do you mean brain science? I was a history major. And he said, well, let me put it this way. We are not rational beings with emotions. At our core, we're emotionally based beings who can only think rationally when we feel that our identities are understood and valued by others. And that's the way we navigate the world in milliseconds all the time. So when you really interrogate what is the nature of how we think, I often say the Enlightenment got it wrong. You know, we are not these rational, reason-based beings, and science will show the way. Well, science has now shown us, actually, it's wrong. I'm sorry about the Scottish Enlightenment. You guys made a big contribution. <laughs> um, <coughs> but the very notion is that we are these deeply, unconsciously-based mammals and beings. And emotions shape I've heard some scientists say, even our capacity to be rational. So we start looking at, okay, we need to understand how we think as a species, the cognition and emotion of our daily existence. And one of the most important things is to understand the nature of how we dehumanize other people and why we dehumanize other people. Because if we're going to address the issue of slavery or trafficking or how we treat migrants and refugees or what's happening in my country with this toxic polarization that's happening, we need to understand why we dehumanize. Because if we get a better understanding of that, maybe we can intervene to really mitigate that and reduce that in some profound ways. And so before I turn it over, I just want to mention two things as I was preparing for this talk about slavery. So one of my colleagues who's a scientist said, if you think of slavery in the United States, it was an act of commission to treat human beings and the way we did in the United States before the founding of the country in the early century. They were acts of commission, chattel slavery, to dehumanize others, to put them in bonds, and to treat them in such ways. But then, you know, we had the Emancipation Proclamation, right? We had the Voting Rights Act. We had all these external manifestations of change to, you know, make slavery illegal or give people more rights. Obviously, that's not sufficient. Yet today, the way people of color, particularly African Americans, are treated is dehumanizing. They know it, and we know it. The question is, why does that still continue among people who are white in the United States who think of themselves as progressive? And that's where commission turns into omission, the scientists say. It almost becomes a neural pathway. And we'll talk to the researchers uh, and others. But we're trying to understand that. We're trying to say, OK, if you understand these dynamics, how do we change it? How do we address it? And if you look at what's happening today with the Rohingya and others, these are acts of commission. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll say is there's also an incredible um, set of research that shows that we process disgust differently than fear in the brain. And when you process dis people through the lens of disgust, when you think of eradication, you think of it as a pathogen threat. When you think of it as something you have to eradicate from us, that can lead to some of the worst behavior towards humans uh, in the world. So I just wanted to sort of tee up, because when we talk about disposable people, we have to talk about the, the, the act, the mindset of dehumanization. So with that, I'd just maybe turn to Kevin to talk a bit about your work and some of the things that sure. you struggle with. Thank you. Um, well, and I'm going to take a, a, an immediate cue from, from you. Oh, I'm gonna Lower that a little bit, starting to feed back. Uh, you, you can't negotiate with someone who's hum humiliated. It's also true that you, you can't really w work with people who have come out of slavery and help them to, in whatever way you can, but, but open the door to lives of fulfillment if they are feeling humiliated. And one of the key things that I've learned over all the years that I've worked across slavery and with people who have come out of slavery is that 
it's very difficult to find people who have come to freedom and don't feel shame, extreme shame and humiliation. And in fact, you know, if, if you know West Africa, you know that in countries like Ghana, your surname will actually indicate whether or not your family had been enslaved in the past. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a secret nobody mentions, even though it's totally obvious to all Ghanaians, is that you know, your surname is actually a slave name, but we don't talk about it, but we're all going to treat you that little bit differently. And you're going to carry this, you're going to carry this taint with you throughout your life, this notion of shame. So many people that I've known who have come to freedom who, uh, who live very productive and have what seem to be very happy lives still carry the shame within them. And one good friend of mine who was enslaved as a child in Haiti has said, you know, every time I stand up to speak, I'm riven with shame, but I push through it anyway. And we've never quite addressed the brain science, and this is where men's work is going so brilliantly. Now, let me then just jump to say something about disposability. Disposable sounds harsh when we talk about people uh, in, in slavery. But the reason why I use that word, uh, and particularly it put it as the title of that book um, that's now almost 20 years old, is because I was analyzing for the first time contemporary forms of slavery as economic activities, as business activities as well. And I'd been studying the history of slavery, but also the history of the business of slavery, because it is an economic activity. People don't just do it to be mean to each other. They do it to make profits. Criminals do it to make profits. And the thing that I discovered that was published for the first time back in 1999 was that the cost of acquiring people into slavery had collapsed. That throughout all of human history, the average cost of an average person in slavery up until the middle of the 20th century was something like, in today's pounds, say 30,000 pounds. Slaves through the average. So from almost all of human history, peop acquiring people into slavery cost a lot. Now, it might not be necessarily money. It might be the fact that you had to w arm a bunch of people with weapons, take them to a far place, have enormous transport costs, and so forth, of, and the cost of, of producing violence. But people were expensive in the past. A slave in, in Mississippi in 1850, a 19-year-old agricultural worker who was no, nothing special in the sense of special skills, would cost $1,200. $1850 for $1850, $1200 you could buy a house, a nice big house, several hundred acres of land, you could buy six oxen. And in when I say 1850 and I say oxen think tractors. So we're talking big. What's the average cost of a human being to acquire today? Around 70 pounds. 70 on average, it's going to go up into the low thousands if we're talking western Europe or North America. But I've met families, entire families, who have been enslaved for as little as 10 pounds in places like northern India. So that was the notion of the disposability, in that for all of human history, slaves had been valuable. And they were, in, they were capital purchase items. And now they've become disposable inputs in the economic criminal processes of enslavement. They're like styrofoam cups. cups. You, you use them, you drink them. We don't have those anymore. They're all fading out. But you, know, you throw them away when you're done with them. And of course, that takes you further down that process if you're the criminal who's able to dehumanize someone to the point of taking control of their life and exploiting them horrifically. If they're really disposable, if they're really inexpensive, it's, it actually takes, it makes it easier for that dehumanization to take place. And you, and you can treat them as truly dehumanized and truly disposable. So that children now who I've known who have been enslaved to basically work as donkeys carrying giant paving stones up and down the mountains in Nepal, if they, if they slip and they fracture an ankle or something like that, they just walk away from them. They'll take the stones off their back, but they'll leave the kids in the crevasse because it costs more to take them to a medical care than it is, would be to go to another village and take another child and so forth. So <clears throat> I suppose if, if that's the factoid that you take away first is that slaves today are cheaper than they've ever been in human history, and that's going to be the nature of it. There's a lot of reasons we could talk about that. A lot of it has to do with the population explosion and the fact that, in a sense, the world is glutted with, the slave market of the world is glutted with potentially enslavable people. Uh, and the total number of people in slavery, in fact, is much smaller than the potentially enslavable number if you look at all the people who are vulnerable and potentially inexpensive. But that's, in a sense, that's foundational fact number one. 
Wow. So, Min, can you talk about not only your research, but some of the activist work you're doing now as well, and particularly following what Kevin was saying? Sure. Um, I think first I want to start with, you know, the term human trafficking in modern slavery is um, conflictual, and people, I think, struggle with it. And I just want to say that there are different terms used in different countries, and, and you can read a lot of Kevin's work and other people's work to, to look at the definition. But um, really, this dehumanization piece is, is that you can do to somebody who um, you see as less than human what you would do to um, property. But what's interesting is you can't, even if we objectify a human being, they still stay human. So a lot of our work, um, a lot of my work is with survivors of slavery who've exited slavery. And what we look at is how most conversations and work and anti-slavery efforts are from the perspective of either the perpetrator or non-survivors who are working to join the anti-slavery efforts. So what do I mean by that? So the perpetrators, they're doing the dehumanizing. But as a survivor of slavery myself, I don't become less human in fact. It is in someone else's mind that I'm less human, but my humanity, I've had to, to struggle to understand, stayed intact. And that becomes a really challenging piece because other people see and I experience dehumanization, but what does it mean for me to still have held my humanity and come to learn that somebody else dehumanized me and I took their belief on as reality in order to survive? So that's one way that we, we often look at things from the perspective of, of the perpetrator. In terms of looking at things from the perspective of free people, I think a lot of the anti-slavery efforts can, can take this air of um, a savior mentality. And I think people understand that, but, but it goes beyond a savior mentality and it really is separating one's humanity from the person whose humanity you think that you're trying to quote unquote save, right? So for example, um, I work with NGOs and we try and work with them to um, for me to come in and talk to survivors and say, look, there's survivors organizing our communities. And NGOs will say, well, they're too vulnerable. And there's good intent in that. And I say, well, but it's their life and they get to choose if they want to talk to me. And it's such a basic fact and it's, it's, it's hard to get people to move beyond thinking, well, I'm a service provider and I'm duty bound to support them and I should be afraid of putting them in harm's way. And at the same time, these survivors have survived and done well without the massive um, f increase in NGOs in the world. So how are we looking at survivors from the perspective of people have survived slavery before modern slavery became an issue? What is going well with them? Talking to survivors and actually asking, how do you view this issue from having been on the inside, rather than how are we viewing it, knowing that's an atrocity from the outside? Thank you. Madeline? Yeah. I I'd like to touch on one of the things that Min just mentioned about the savior complex and the, the complicated relationship that it is when you do physically save somebody's life or a lot of people's lives. It, it is very easy to be seen as a savior and it's something that is, it's actually an extremely uncomfortable role to be considered in. But also in many rescue situations, the dehumanization that also occurs. And on the ships that I worked on, we made a really conscious decision, no gloves. So the first thing when somebody is in the water or being welcomed on board the ship is it's skin contact with somebody and, they, and everybody receives the words, welcome on board. And it doesn't really matter whether you understand the language or not when somebody looks in your eyes and shakes your hand, mm -hmm. and brings you on board and says, welcome on board. And when you give them a welcome pack and they say, I don't want the pink blanket, I want the green blanket, you're like, great. I'll find you a green blanket because people shouldn't feel grateful just because they're not in the water anymore. They should feel so confident in themselves that they want a green blanket. Like that is a really wonderful example of survival. And as a, a person engaged in rescue, I don't want to be in that relationship of the savior. I don't want those people to feel indebted to me. I'm just accomplishing like the most basic human service. I'm there to stop people from drowning. It's really, it's not an act of savior, it's just a very basic act of humanity. So I'm glad to be part of it, but I don't really want to be the savior. Can I just follow, follow up, there we go, uh, follow up on the last two points that were made um, about the savior complex. I was remembering that 
in some of the research on dehumanization, the way scientists sort of categorize it in three areas is objectification, uh, sort of a mechanistic view of people as automaton, and animalistic. You know, they're not like us. They're rats. They're vermin. <coughs> they're a threat to us. You know, it's the, path it's the pathogen threat to one. But, it, but objectification is to deny somebody of their own mind. Mm -hmm. And one thing we all have to be careful of, not just those who are privileged, as we are in this room, um, but also people in government, people in funding agencies, even donors, is the objectification of people you, in theory, are trying to help, right? <laughs> because that's a form of dehumanization. And I think we have to really recognize that. Yeah, I'll just respond um, talking about my, my research. So I am looking at the well-being of survivors of slavery. Um, and really, one of the um, aspects that when we look at survivors coming out and dealing with the trauma, we actually focus a lot more on basic needs. And, and those are important. And at the same time, I say to folks, how, do you, how does somebody who doesn't even believe that they deserve to be alive feel comfortable with the housing that you're providing or the food that you're providing, right? Those things are very, very important. But if we, if we look at brain research, if you have basic um, foundational memories in being, in being enslaved, all you know of the world is I have to survive. So you need new neural experiences, which because the brain is, is plastic, Every interaction adds to that new statistic, right? So the first interaction with somebody treating you like a human being adds to the bucket of new neural experiences. And that is why looking at how each of us dehumanize each other and how that expands to survivors of all kinds of conflict and trauma is really important. There's, there are therapeutic, therapeutically um, beneficial interventions that are done by non-therapists, like looking someone in the eye or talking to survivors and not assuming that the best they can do is to tell you all the details of what they went through. Right, mm -hmm. or I think Madeline, just taking that glove off mm -hmm. um, could release oxytocin in another human yeah. being, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. the touching of skin is where, is where trust, that, that hormone, a chemical of trust is uh, released. Um, and one of the things we learned from one of our um, researchers who spent four years in the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan, and he said, just looking somebody in the eye, mm -hmm. and at the level you look at them in the eye, begins the process of rehumanization for them, mm -hmm. right? Um, and Min, could you talk about both how you interact with other human beings in this moment of profound trauma, right? And because we tend to think of it as, and this is a big problem with a lot of humanitarian work, is you give them a tent, right? You mm -hmm. give them a bed, you give them a meal. Mm. With this, okay, that's basic. If you remember the Romanian orphans in the early 90s, they had all of this, and yet they didn't survive, right? Mm -hmm. Because they were missing human connection and human touch mm -hmm. and a sense of belonging and a sense that people care for me and us. Actually, one of the very nice experiences we often had on board the Aquarius was we just put a couple of drums out on deck and people could make music. And while sometimes that generated maybe a little bit too much excitement in a very cramped environment, <laughs> it's just allowing people to do what they want to do. We're not telling everybody, okay, now everybody lie down, now everybody stand up, now everybody let's check your temperature, everybody go to sleep. Or it's just like, here, well, here's a couple of drums, do what you want. And that was a really amazing experience. There were times when the ship was really ringing with the rhythm of life beautifully. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, when I looked at the description of the workshop, I thought, okay, the, what about the impact of trauma can I tell people? I think one of the basic things we don't quite know and understand how to talk about is, is the breaking of human trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I wanted to ask, raise your hand if you've experienced heartbreak. Wow, some of you haven't. I'm <laughs> so this is Scotland. That Open is up. shocking. There. There. Uh, go are you, please. Scots. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Please. They're cold in here sometimes. Please yeah. inform me how you made that happen. Um, <laughs> um, so, for those of you who have, um, I imagine it's some, some at the core of that was a relationship to somebody or something. So, when you've been dehumanized by another human being, what? What happens is the core of human connection, which we as social beings need, mm 
is harmed. How do you rebuild that trust? So a lot of times I will just say to survivors, you have no reason to trust me. You have absolutely no reason to trust me. And I deserve to earn that trust. I deserve to jump through every hoop and I'm going to fail you. I don't pretend that I'm gonna actually gain it. And I think it starts with the understanding that people, we, we, because we think we're these rational beings, we think, well, you're no longer in danger, you should get on with your life and be happy because you're free. Well, that's not how the brain works and it's not how life works, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we actually uh, relate to people where they're at in terms of, yes, you, you went through something and you're a human being and like any other human being, I actually, you don't know me, why should you tell me everything about you? I just touched your body. How would you feel if I just walked up and touched your body? Right? We're not thinking through some of the basic assumptions of how we relate to other people. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, this is, and not necessarily even understanding the transformation that has gone on in a person's mind when they've been caught mm. and held and controlled. Mm -hmm. I was so fortunate that one of the very first people that I met who had come out of slavery was someone who had been enslaved as an eight-year-old in Paris by a, a family that she was sent to work for. And she was enslaved, and, she, and I met her at 19. She had just come to freedom about three days before. And we were having a conversation, and I was full of good intentions and complete, you know, imaginary ideas about what slavery was about, because this was very early in the work. And I, and I remember saying to her something about, oh, it must be great to be having choices now. It must be great. Choices are so great. She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, did she not understand what, I, you know, so I said, but choices are so important, aren't they? And, they, and, and you must be really, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I thought, no, something's not connecting. And I said, oh, I don't think we're connecting. Can talk to me about what is it about these choices? And she says, everybody's talking to me about these choice things. No one will show me one of these things. I know I'm supposed to like them, but no one will show me one. So now I just tell everybody, yeah, I love choices. And I realized I had completely missed. I totally, as a person born and to live in freedom, I, could, I couldn't grasp what was going on. And I backed completely up and I said, there was a, there was a lamp that had a, a globe that was painted to look like the planet Earth. And I said, what's, what's, what do you think about that lamp? She said, it's blue and green. She had no notion that the Earth was round. And as we began, as I, the more I backed up, I began to realize she had no notion. She's 19 years old. She's been living in Paris. She has no notion of sea. She knows there are hot and cold times, but not that there are seasons. She didn't know the months. She didn't know years. She didn't know how old she was. The, there was a fundamental difference that was so great that I was assuming that there was something shared in the humanity that was so profound that I would, I would transcend that. No. And in a sense, that, that's just an illustration of that very significant difference, which is absolutely bridgeable, mm -hmm. but you have to understand what that, where that bridge mm -hmm. is and how to construct it. Yeah. You know, uh, j just listening is a profound paradox of being human, right? So we're talking about how we, um, through objectification and other ways, dehumanize others, which is really to take away their mind, you know? To, to, and then there's, from that follows horrible physical behavior towards people. And, and yet, what I hear, when you talk about the shame people feel, or you talk about people want to be heard and understood, right, is the person who has been dehumanized is the one who has the profound responsibility for themselves to recognize what it is to humanize themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And it begins with basic things, which is about touch, no, not others, but their sense that they can feel safe and comfortable in the world, right? That they can be seen as they experience the world. Um, that they feel, um, what's the word? A sense of um, a validation. Validation as they see their condition in the world at that time, mm -hmm. right? And it's an incremental step. It's, it's also very difficult for us not to engage in dehumanizing behaviors because there are certain images that do resonate with us and to go back to that image that just keeps coming up is the the baby boy Alan Curdy on the beach that touched everybody but when you go out onto the deck of a ship and you see 300 or 500 young men aged between 15 and 25 
it's more difficult for the general public to think I can engage with each one of these people as an individual, each one of these people has a place in my society, I care about each one of these people, I can have space in my life for every one of these stories and I can trust and respect them and I can welcome them. It's much easier to feel that compassion for one person. Right. Thank you. I, I I've got a sense there are going to be a lot of questions, so why don't we turn to the audience, and if you could raise your hand, and then there will be a mic that will come. There's one. There we are. Um, yeah, I worked with um, Will Rescue as well in uh, Les Boss during 15, 16, and during that time the language changed um, very much from refugee to migrant. And I'm wondering how, how you, what do you think about that in, in terms of dehumanizing? Um, a refugee is a person who has applied for refugee status. And so it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody who gets in a boat and tries to come to Europe. And while migrant, I think, originally had a negative connotation, it is more inclusive and it means anybody who's trying to cross that body of water and not saying that those who are refugees have a right and those who are migrants do not have a right by calling everybody migrants, everybody in the same boat, they all have a right to survive and it's not up to the rescuers to decide whether they have a right to apply for asylum and to be granted refugee status. So many of the people who have been rescued by the boats that I work on when, will never be granted refugee status but that does not mean that they are not worthy of rescue and worthy of living in this community, even though they don't meet the criteria for being refugees. I couldn't say it better. I mean, I think you're pointing to um, political use of terminology and mm. words, and I'm, I'm yeah. very keen on looking at who's using the word for what purpose, mm. and that everybody's, not everyone, but there's different camps of people who are using it for different reasons, and so it's really important to look at the impact of that word. Um, for me, I think that there it becomes this battle of who is a valid victim and who is an invalid victim and who's worthy and unworthy. And, and that, whatever word is used, I don't support that use of terminology. Yeah, I remember meeting this Syrian refugee in Jordan. And she said, I'm tired of people calling me a refugee. My name is Amina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I thought of my grandmother who was born in Ireland and came as a 17-year-old uh, young girl to the United States. And she told me when I was young and she was much older that people kept on calling her an immigrant. And she said, no, my name is Catherine. Mm -hmm. And it just struck me, you know, this time is still there. Other questions? I know it's early, but it's not that early. <laughs> There's There's been much discussion about post-traumatic stress disorder in the British press recently with the military. Do you think they're in a similar situation to survivors and it's a neural problem fundamentally? Yes and no. I was trying to decide whether to say yes or no first, um, <laughs> which hopefully tells you about my answer. So post-traumatic stress disorder is a very clinical, medical, formal diagnosis, which I think some people have. And yet, I have a love-hate relationship with diagnoses because they're useful to frame experiences, and yet they can be seen as extreme responses to situations. A lot of people are responding as any human being would to these situations, right? So I think a lot of people going through these types of situations are going to get the clinical diagnosis of PTSD, and yet, um, that diagnosis has been contested for years. I think one thing that's really important is the difference between a traumatic event and an ongoing trauma. One episode of trauma is fundamentally different from years and years of ongoing trauma. And if that trauma is also on top of generational trauma, on top of child abuse trauma, on top of political terrorism, you know. So I think we're not, we often fail to see the complexity of the, the traumatic experiences people are, are suffering. Can I, it, it doesn't diminish what happens to people in the military. Clearly, you know, event-based yeah. trauma, when, when that IAD goes off and your world is destroyed, 
is an enormously traumatic event and it, and it requires an, a lot of support. Mm -hmm. But we also know that, that, that it's what's called complex mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which is the long-term layered type, uh, has a whole series of diff slightly different pres presenting behaviors and presenting actions and has to be dealt with in certain ways. And certainly, it, it's taken a long time for this to become understood. I've spent a lot of time as an expert witness in trials, helping judges to understand that if you have complex trauma, it makes it difficult for you to keep things in temporal order in your mind, which makes you a very unreliable witness when you go onto the witness stand. But you have to understand that fact, that in fact, the very victimization that you've had as a, as a, as a victim of crime in wh whichever sort of violent or, or <coughs> slavery crime it is, has in fact created the situation in which you have to be treated as a slightly different type of witness simply because you can't keep things straight because it's one of the impactful outcomes of complex PTSD. Yeah, I just said that one of the things I learned from one of our researchers is that trauma is not trauma for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, and even in a refugee camp, not everybody has trauma the same way. And even <laughs> Twin brothers will not have trauma the same way because, in a sense, every brain is different. Mm -hmm. But when I heard you both speak, I was thinking of the word betrayal because one thing I can imagine, particularly if you've been enslaved or if you've been forced to migrate and lose everything, is a sense of betrayal of a sense of normalcy that you once mm -hmm. had if you had it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I noticed when I came back after the U.S. election, I was in the U.K., I should say I voted early, and then I left and came back 10 days later, and there were two people working in the building I lived in. One was a Brazilian immigrant, and the other was um, Vietnamese American. And they were very, very upset. And I thought, boy, they're really upset. They had to take two or three days off. And I asked them, I said, what, what was so particularly upsetting about this election, beyond the obvious, um, that was different than when let's say George Bush got elected, and they said a deep sense of betrayal. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, we live in this country, maybe we don't feel as fully in integrated and ingrained in America, but if other American people can vote for a man like that, how can we feel safe? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't get picked up in the press a lot, frankly. Mm -hmm. It's the sense of betrayal that they feel unmoored. And now, a year and a half later, because I see them over every day, they say the betrayal hasn't left. And it's not that their leaders have done that, but people, in a sense, in the same metaphorical boat have done that, right? That they have betrayed them. How can they feel safe on this place? Mm -hmm. and, and a number of them had never gone to therapy and now go to therapy. And it's, a, I don't know if you call it trauma, but a sense of dislocation, a mm -hmm. sense of not feeling safe the way they felt before. Mm -hmm. and, and to a large extent, trust is mm -hmm. uh, contingent on consistency yeah. and predictability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing I'd just to add to that, though, particularly about people who have been caught up in slavery, is that uh, I'm going to make an enormous generalization, but say, if you look at all the 40 million or so people in the world who are enslaved today, you can actually draw a line mm -hmm. and put them into two categories, because there are people who have known freedom and then been brought into slavery. But what a lot of people aren't aware of is that there are a very millions of people mm -hmm. who are caught up in hereditary forms yeah. of slavery in northern India, Nepal, Pakistan, in West, North and West Africa, hereditary forms of slavery, just like the sorts that, you, that we read about in history and we think are over, but there are millions of people in that situation. And the nature of being born into slavery, into gener intergenerational slavery, is a very different psychological set. Uh, you know, it, yeah, there's, there's, in a sense, there's, no, there's trust, but it's a trust of, I trust that I am under the control of this family. My family's always been owned by or controlled by this other family or this other individual. And it's a very different type of response that needs a different type of response to it. Interestingly, one of the most powerful ways to work with people who have been in hereditary slavery is actually just to begin a, a sort of Socratic dialogue. Uh, we have workers, my old NGO, would send workers into these villages of hereditary, whole villages in hereditary slavery. And it would just start with someone who looks just like them, speaks their language, often their ethnicity, who has often been a, enslaved themselves, 
sitting down with them and, and just conversing for weeks, and at, usually at supper time, and saying, so how long have you all lived here? Oh, forever, right? Do, who do you work for? Oh, all for the same person, right? How long, did you ever go to the city? No, there is a city, right? They don't even know there's a city. They've never been out of, you know, 100 yards from this space. Does this man ever hit you that you all were? Oh, he does. Do you ever hit him? Oh, never? Oh, you know. And, then, and, the, and the Socratic dialogue goes on for sometimes three, four, five weeks until finally they say, you know, this is a lot like that word slave that's in our language. And they begin to say, yeah. But it takes that kind of long, slow understanding to, to even realize that the world without freedom in which you live, if you've ever never known any, mm -hmm. right. Can exist right. that the world with freedom. It's a can. cognitive shift, is what yeah. you're leading it's to. It's huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. they get really excited when they, yeah. when they get it. Maybe. Well, and I'll just say it's 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 a cognitive shift that's costly. Yeah. Because you know part of what I'm looking into is is if you have someone whose psychological defenses are to believe that they deserve slavery mm -hmm. and to adjust to slavery just to survive it, then most people need unbelievable evidence to let go of those beliefs. Much as we might say that they're false beliefs and they were old and no, now you don't need them, say that to somebody who all they've ever known is slavery. And so we don't, we're not committed, so all of our um, interventions that are one year, two year, I mean, they're not gonna work because they're not looking at how ingrained, how important it is for somebody. They have to take a leap of faith to know, at some point um, and yet when taking that leap of faith means putting every fear that you have of your life being in danger um, to somehow rationally tell yourself that that's not true is, is, fun, is just profoundly difficult. I mean, we were wired to protect ourselves, right? Homeostasis. Right? Yeah. So I think we, we really need to look at how, how are we supporting people in a way that respects that it's going to be a long journey to understand freedom. And as we're saying, in the United Kingdom, not very well. <laughs> right? We're not doing that very well at all. Yeah. In fact, we're, asked, we're, we're treating people who have come out of slavery it's as if they, that they have to prove that they were victims of a violent crime before they're treated. You know, if you were the victim of any other violent crime, you wouldn't have to suddenly have to prove that you were. They would look at you and say, you know, sorry. sorry. Um, I know we're coming, yes. Uh, I love the prompts in the back. Um, can I put a prompt up, black coffee? No. <laughs> um, but we're going to um, actually quickly segue to a short video um, of Madeline's work. And um, I'd just like to introduce it by saying I am slightly self-conscious about watching this video, but it is going to be shown. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So let's just do So it. take it away. You'd like it to be shown, but have no one look. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody close your eyes. So, you know what's not easy, as we know, is to be able to hear about this reality, to know that even the most thoughtful, best intended, either private individuals or governments, 
the work that's required is so profoundly hard, right? Mm -hmm. What do people, and I don't mean just people in this audience or governments, how do people who really do care and want to play a role, and I don't mean like, and write a check and here's the website. I'm talking about... You can do that too. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's... I, I, you know, if there's anything about if there's such a thing as rehumanization is to recognize the mind and the humanity of others in ways that are real and not metaphorical. What would you all end this by saying? I think that there's a real risk of stereotypes and just to establish one relationship with one person has a lot of value instead of trying to solve the Syrian refugee crisis or something like that. Just like make friends with somebody who lives in your neighborhood and understand that if you've lived in a camp all your life where water has been really impossible, when you turn on the tap and water comes out, like you feel like you need to leave the tap running. So people are coming from such extremely different environments and recognize that and help them guide the complex world that we take for granted. Um, I often tell people to cry with the earth. Um, so. Oftentimes people want to, to know what to do with me and sometimes I just need people to sit with me. And so I think, off, I think we have a very hard time sitting with people's pain. We want to fix it or solve it. Um, so I would say one is be willing to sit with someone and just sit there. The other is to share some experience of pain or heartbreak um, that you know because as you share that, other people will share that. And, and it's a way that I think we experience one another's humanity is through our shared overcoming of challenges. Send a check to <laughs> men's organization. It's called the Survivor Alliance, and it's the only group of, by survivors for survivors on the planet Earth in the history of the planet Earth. Right. But I'm also just going to give you the optimistic okay. and the truth, which is there are something like 40-some million people in slavery in the world today. There are something like 7.3 billion people on the planet. That's the smallest fraction of the global population to ever be in slavery in all of human history. The $150 billion per year in the criminal economy that generated by slavery is by far the tiniest fraction of the global economy to ever be represented by slavery. We're actually living at a historical moment where slavery is, has been pushed to the very edges of our societies. It's big, but it's actually tiny. It's about the same sort of numbers as people who, with HIV. And it's standing on the edge of its own extinction. And we can push it over that edge. We can push it over that precipice if we think carefully and invest a little bit more in time and energy and funds. And we know how much it's going to cost. We actually know this from doing the projections and like this. And it's not much. It's like $23 billion over a 10-year period of dollars of pounds, it doesn't really matter, which in global terms is peanuts. So we're actually at a point where we can go through and put in pretty much an end to this. I don't, will we end slavery forever? Probably not, because there are bad people who want to treat each other badly. But my personal goal is that it becomes like cannibalism in the mm -hmm. sense that, you know, when you see in something in the newspaper, one person eats one other person anywhere in the world, it's big news. I want slavery to be like that. Yeah. One person enslaved one other person it's really big news. I don't know why the cannibalism cases are always in Germany, but that's a different, <laughs> that's a different panel. Oh, yeah. That's a different panel. Yeah. All right. Thank you all, and stay away from Germany. Okay.